It's not even an argument when I say that the number one reason why Ben 10 was as popular as it got, and to some extent still is, is because of the wide selection of aliens Ben could turn into. If you don't like one alien, don't worry, there's nine more to choose from. And if you don't like any of the ten? Well then you're probably not real and have no taste at all. But as from season 2 of the show, Man of Action decided 10 wasn't enough, and kept dropping alien after alien for us to fall in love with. That and buy more toys, obviously. The great thing about the new aliens we got, is they got to be more creative with them. Since the original 10 got us used to the idea that anything Ben could turn into is some sort of alien race, that the newer designs could focus more on just looking cool and use some more earthly inspirations. Best example being the first unlocked alien in the show, Cannonbolt. Although his original concept was clearly very insect-like, the final design we got couldn't be further from it. The only insect-like design left being his hard shell and the ability to roll into a ball like a pill bug, which aren't technically insects, they're isopods, making them more closely related to the sea-dwelling arthropods like shrimp, crabs, and their pig cousin, the giant isopod. Plus, Cannonbolt is based on another animal that can also do the same things pill bugs can, and have a hard exterior shell too. Armadillos are the mammal's answer to the pill bugs, as both animals can roll up completely into a ball when threatened. Armadillos are also pretty well known for their long sharp claws, which they use for digging, something we can see in Cannonbolt's design, along with the yellow plating sharing the same color as the six-band armadillo, aka the yellow armadillo. And yes, I'll be mentioning this guy again in a future video, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for that. Now back to Cannonbolt. Other than the yellow shell, Cannonbolt's main color scheme is black and white, which even though that's pretty common for Ben 10, it's more intentional for Cannonbolt, since it's the same color palette as panda bears, which are not only known for being generally clumsy animals like Cannonbolt, but also roll around for fun. Another similarity between the two can be found in Cannonbolt's species state of... well... existence. Arbori- The Arbor- The Arborean Pelor- The Arborean Pearl- Arborean Peralta's home planet was destroyed by the big tick we see in the Cannonbolt's debut episode, and are believed to be extinct, which is made even more sad when you realize we never see another one of his species in the background of any Benton episode, unlike most of the other aliens. Luckily pandas don't have it as bad. They are the poster child for endangered animals, even being the mascot of the WWF, but on the brighter side, Panda's population has actually increased and aren't listed as endangered anymore. They're listed as vulnerable, which still isn't much, but it's definitely an improvement. Unlike the AI, who is still endangered and the main inspiration for eye guy species, other than just the name, AIs are well known for their large eyes they use to see at night, since they're nocturnal. And they also have two large bat-like ears they use to locate insects hiding inside trees, similar to the large ears that take up most of eye guy's face. Also fun fact, did you know the tarsiers hold the record for the largest eyes compared to an animal's body? Now tarsiers and eyes aren't that closely related anymore since before they were thought to be both lemurs, but in the thousands scientists realized they're more of their own thing. Still both primates, so now instead of them being cousins, they're more like second cousins. Now as for eye guy's powers, it's a stereotype in fiction for eyes to have a sort of psychic link to the universe, which could explain why eye guy can shoot different elements from his eyes, like electricity, ice beams, and laser beams, like a lot of popular fictional characters, like Superman or Cyclops. There's a dime a dozen superhero inspirations and a lot of Ben's aliens, but easily the most obvious one is way big. I could probably cut him out of this video, because I wouldn't be surprised if you all knew he was inspired by Ultraman. I wouldn't even call it an inspiration, he's mostly a copy and paste of him, with the biggest difference being Way Big's extra set of eyes he uses to see where he's stepping, which credit where credit is due, that's a pretty cool detail, too bad they forgot about it in UAF. There's also the Japanese accent they give him an omniverse and the laser beams he shoots the same way Ultraman does, but those came after the original show. A little detail about Ultraman that I didn't know before researching him for this video is that Ultraman himself is an alien that merges with a human host. Keep in mind my only exposure to Ultraman before this video is knowing Waybix's design was based on him and the Netflix movie Ultraman Rising, but this does make it a good fit as an inspiration for a Ben 10 alien, since you know, something extraterrestrial makes its way down to earth, merging with a human and giving him the ability to transform into a hero is almost beat for beat with Ben's story. Copy my whole fucking flow! Oh, word for shit. word, bar for bar! <laughs> The next three aliens, like Way Big, also have a pretty obvious design origin. The Halloween trio being Ben Wolf, Ben Mummy, and Ben Victor. Wait, wait, sorry, uh, my mind got stuck in the past for a bit. Blitzwolf, Frankenstrike, and Snero are based on some of the most popular fictional monsters. Werewolves, Frankenstein's monster, and mummies. Wait, 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 
R wrong mummy, move on. Not only are the three of them popular monsters, but they're also the main monsters in Universal's old horror movies, The Wolfman, Frankenstein, and The Mummy. All three of them are meant to be tied together since not only are all just alien versions of popular horror characters, but they're also unlocked by scanning the scare's three henchmen, but let's break them down individually. Blitzwolfer is not only a werewolf design-wise, but one of the few alien transformations that took an extended period of time to fully complete, to really emphasize the transformation from man to wolf, since that's the main focus of most werewolves in fiction. Ben even first unlocking the transformation while fighting the Lebowan and getting both bitten and scratched in the process, the two most popular ways on how someone can turn into a werewolf. Like werewolves, this wolfer has enhanced speed, strength, and heightened sense of smell, but he also gains the super howls, which even though werewolves don't have that, it's a pretty iconic part of their character, so turning that into a superpower makes sense. Frankenstrike is both Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster combined as one. Physically, he's a larger humanoid with almost dead-looking skin, covered in stitch-like patterns, and bolts to make him look like the monster made from multiple dead body parts, stitched together and brought to life with electricity, which makes electrical powers the obvious choice, along with being able to merge some machines to his mini power plants on his back like how scientists would build machines. Although I don't remember seeing Ben do this, we know Victor can do it, so Ben could probably do it that too. Speaking of Victor, Victor Frankenstein, evil scientist that brings something back from the dead, not only that but having misshapen eyes like most depictions of Igor, while also calling to scare master, so he's basically all three iconic characters from Frankenstein as one, but as for Frankenstrike I don't think there's any Igor-like details. But he was originally meant to have a higher intelligence than most of Ben's aliens, like Dr. Frankenstein, but I think that might have been retconned in Omniverse, either way originally he was meant to be smart, therefore Dr. Frankenstein's still an inspiration. Snero is your average mummified pharaoh with Egyptian inspired clothing and bandages all over his body, only difference being the bandages are the body themselves. Now all three of these aliens weren't meant to have too much hidden details, they were just meant to look like cool versions of classic monsters, with most of the cool details being found on the villains that unlock the DNA, the werewolf biting Ben and slowly turning him into Blitzwolfer around the Navajo tribe, which are very connected to werewolves and skinwalkers, Victor being a mix of Frankenstein, the monster and Igor, and the mummy being the one to try locate the corrodium that's used to mutate people that get too close to it, like how there's some sort of MacGuffin artifact with a curse in most mummy movies. Only other thing Snero could be based on is Stretch Armstrong because of his powers to stretch out his bandages like Wildvine. Wildvine's Stretch Armstrong connection is probably his only non-plant inspiration, with a lot of other details about his powers and design being found in a wide selection of plants. Most obvious the structure around his head being a Venus flytrap, which used their modified leaves to trap insects and consume them like a mouth, so having them around the head works both functionally and aesthetically. Wildvine's explosive found on his backs mostly look like eggplants, but the exploding aspect is actually not that uncommon in plants, since a lot of different species have seed pods that explode in order to spread their seeds around. A good example being the... Um... Well, you can read it for yourself which also has the eggplant-like shape, like Wildvine's explosives. Circling back to Wildvine's main powers, vines can stretch out for long distances, with the longest recorded vine being an elephant creeper that was 1.5 kilometers long. Now obviously, like all plants, they can't just stretch out immediately, but you know, vine is in the name, so easy connection. You could also say that he's inspired by plant-like aliens that even though look and function similar to plants, are usually a lot more aggressive in some cases, like the feral wild vines in The Secret of the Omnitrix. So now we've seen both humanoid and plant-like inspired alien inspirations. What about the most likely real-life alien inspiration? Microscopic aliens. We have actually found evidence of fossilized microscopic bacteria and a meteor believed to have come from Mars, so basing an alien of microscopic organisms was going to happen at some point. Although Ditto is based on single-celled organisms in powers alone, being able to split apart in the same way cells reproduce using a process known as mitosis, where first the contents inside the cell duplicate and then the rest of the cell splits in two. Now physically and character-wise, Ditto is a cartoon character. By that I mean the old slapstick cartoons like Looney Tunes and Animaniacs which is why Rob Paulson was the perfect voice for him. Even being mostly just black and white just gives him that similar look to a lot of classic black and white cartoons, like Felix the Cat. Another duplicating alien we get in classic is Buzzshock, and even though you could say he could also have been based on single-celled organisms, I'd say he's most obviously based on gremlins, especially when you compare them to the Megawatts. 
small mischievous creatures that mess around with technology just for fun is a one-to-one -one comparison with both megawatts and gremlins, duplicating and wreaking havoc because our main character failed to follow the rules. If that's not enough of a comparison, in the second Gremlins movie, we get a special electricity gremlin that zaps around wires just like Buzzshock. So yeah, there's no doubt Buzzshock is a gremlin. Physically, he's meant to look more like a battery, with Omniverse making it even more obvious. And I'd also say there's some inspiration from Little Green Men, stereotypical little mischievous aliens with big eyes and big heads, sort of similar to the greys, but green-skinned and cause more trouble. And Little Green Men is also used as another name for you guessed it, gremlins. Now the last three aliens we have could be seen as their own unlikely trio, since technically they were all meant to be the same alien. Both Arctic One and Spitter are reused beta designs for Upchuck, and even power-wise they all still have different versions of a vomiting power, like Zeitgeist from X-Men or Reptile from Mortal Kombat. Arctiguana, having meant to have Upchuck's powers instead, now has Ice Breath, with a cool blue design to emphasize it. Not only can Arctiguana be classified as a reptilian alien, but the lizard-like design is also meant to be ironic. Most reptiles including iguanas are ectothermic, or more commonly known as cold-blooded, meaning they can't generate heat like us mammals, and therefore need to get their heat from an outside source, which is why most reptiles are found in hotter temperatures, with only a few being able to generate some heat, like tegus, but even they're only able to generate a small amount when they really need to. The ironic reptile with ice powers is also something we see in a lot of other media, with different dragons with ice powers, and more recent additions being the Frigibax line from Pokemon and Shimo from Godzilla X Kong. Spitter is a little closer to Upchuck's final design, even having his powers being, well, just vomit. Design-wise we could also add him to the reptilian category, because of his green skin, lizard-like hands, and tail. Now even though lizards aren't known to spit, there are multiple ones with either toxic saliva or venom. And there are snakes that spit venom, like the spitting cobra, which genetically a lot of herpetologists are saying they could basically be considered lizards. But the main design feature is probably his cannon-shaped body, with instead of shooting out cannonballs, he just shoots out, well, bile. Even him inflating when he's about to shoot is similar to the same animation used on cannons in a lot of cartoons. Upchuck still keeps a lot of reptilian-like design elements, like the multiple chameleon-like tongues, with the Merc version in UA of doubling down on by giving him darker and drier looking skin. But mainly Upchuck is meant to be based on microscopic organisms like the Tardigrade and especially amoebas. Upchuck's round plump gummy bear-like body is pretty similar to Tardigrades, aka water bears, with even the little nubs on his head looking like Tardigrade's feet. Plus they're pretty well known for being almost impossible to kill and able to survive, you guessed it, in space. Amoebas on the other hand are another microscopic organisms that are pretty well known for one thing specifically eating. Using a process known as phagocytosis, amoebas wrap around whatever other cell they come across and consume it whole, then absorb whatever nutrients they need and spit out whatever is left. And even looking at some of the other beta designs, you can see multiple times where they went for a more gelatinous cell look. Even though we mentioned Upchuck being based on reptiles, we can also see frog-like design elements, especially in the original design that inspired Arctiguana. So you could technically also say Arctiguana is a frog, sort of. Frogs are well known for their long tongues for catching food, like the previously mentioned chameleons. But if you ask anyone that owns a large frog or toad to describe them in one word, the word would be hungry. One of these amphibians will literally do nothing except for sitting in one spot waiting for literally anything to walk in front of it and then immediately shove it down their throat. And yes, sometimes they can spend over a year not moving an inch just so they can wait for food. 